So, thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today in this UK UAT panel discussion about UK vertical farming industry and what they are doing with strawberries. So, first things first, my name is Katja Zaharaki and I am the Communication Director for UK Urban Agritech, or UK UAT for short. I am as well a researcher with my main. This panel has been organized by UKUAT. UKUAT is a membership organization, a cross industry group devoted to promote urban agritech as a solution for food and environmental crisis. We work across a number of areas in a pre competitive space, including policy, education, and exchange of knowledge and expertise. We also collaborate to amplify our collective voice. An example of which is this very panel. To find more about UK UAT, you can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. But for now, let's go to our two panelists. We are very fortunate to have with us today Dr. Jabba Horning, plant scientist at Intelligent Growth Solution, and Peter James Lennox, project manager at CropTech. So now I'm going to pass it over to you guys to introduce yourself. And we're starting with Java. Java, over to you. Okay, thank you very much, Katya. I hope you can hear me and uh, hello everybody. And uh, I'm really glad that I can be here today and uh, I can meet you through this webinar. Uh, so I am Chaba Hornik. I work in IGS Limited, the intelligence growth solution company as a plant scientist. Uh, I joined the company uh, well, about one year ago and uh, I started to work on many, many crops, including strawberries. IGS is a Scotland-based uh, company and we are an agrotech innovator. And we provide uh, uh, smart solutions for farmers who want to grow crops. And uh, it's very important to stress, we do not grow crops, we uh, develop continuously uh, the, the technology behind the software and the hardware enabling uh, other businesses to grow and uh, produce actually crops. As a plant scientist, uh, I, uh, I work uh, on designing and executing different plant trials and customer trials as well. I continuously optimizing the environment, the recipes that we use, and this is how I try to support our company. So IGS was uh, established in 2000, 2013, and we build uh, basically vertical farming and totally closed environment agriculture uh, solution with a high level of automation and uh, very precise uh, control on the, on the environment, providing the best that we can for the plants uh, in order to get the best yield, the best quality and uh, ultimately providing a background for farmers, producing high quality food for people. Thank you, Katya. Thank you, Jabba, that's really good. Peter, over to you. Thank you, Katya. Uh, my name is Peter Lennox. I'm the project manager for CropTech. Um, CropTech is a grower-focused, UK-based, uh, sustainability-driven agricultural uh, um, technologies company. We provide not only LED lights, but horticultural solutions for indoor growing and um, control systems that control everything inside your grow room. Uh, founded in 2007 as a research LED focused uh, company, we've expanded our uh, um, activities into uh, the wider range of agriculture and closed loop um, agriculture, uh, TCA. TCEA, as uh, Katie likes to call it. Uh, CropTech supports all our growers um, via um, close uh, um, support um, inside uh, um, the agricultural sector. Um, and a bit about myself, um, I was raised um, on a strawberry farm, um, old school, um, raised beds, uh, low tunnels, and um, uh, labor intensive. Um, so yeah, thank you, Katie. That's good, thank you. I know you can say lots of things about your farm back at home, but uh, let's go forward for now. So just to let you know, everyone, that you are in this meeting, you can type any questions you have in the chat, please. And um, 
after we go through some of the questions I have prepared for Zaba and Peter, uh, we will try to answer as many as possible uh, of your questions. So first question for you. What do you think is going to be the role of TCEA for the strawberry production in the future? Is it going to be part of the supply chain or will mainly act as experimental facilities and propagation or bleeding purposes? So we can start with Peter for this one. Thank you, Katie. Um, yes, um, the supply chain, it will definitely be part of that. Um, the way we see things at the moment, it's mainly research-based um, with um, research partners all over the world, um, including uh, um, the UK, Europe, and Africa, looking at these uh, um, systems um, to develop and expand into larger scale facilities. So at the moment, yes, it's a, a cost-driven exercise and uh, it's mainly for research. But in the near future, we'll see large facilities um, supplying strawberries um, in TCA conditions. That sounds good. Thank you, Peter. Zappa, what is your view? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, well, um, actually, yeah, yes, I agree with Peter. Uh, at the moment, uh, the technology is not widely spread. And this is the main reason why we have to say this is a kind of experimental and first stage something. But uh, you know, uh, with, with the time, uh, it is heavily expanding and uh, you will see different type of uh, controlled environment uh, growing facilities everywhere now on the world, on every continent. And, uh, you know, it is just a kind of time and, and probably uh, money, uh, how long it takes to be much more widespread. And I really believe that uh, this technology will be a part of the supply chain, definitely. At the moment, and as, as, as today, uh, for example, our facility uh, plays a major role, probably mainly uh, the plant production only and not berry production, what is probably in the focus of all, all the farmers around the world. But, uh, but we have to point out that uh, there are other options and uh, other important things in the, in the food supply chain of, of, of a berry, what, a, what the customer buys at the end of the day in the shops, because you have to start from either from seeds or from small plants. You have to raise these plants, you have to make them flower, you have to produce berries, and after that you have to collect it. So, uh, and, and I think that uh, our environment will probably ultimately play, play a very important role at the moment, I would say that uh, plant production is the most important part. Yeah, makes sense actually. It um, includes a lot of challenge in growing strawberries and uh, trying to achieve uh, a good uh, yield and berry, which I guess some people they have cracked this uh, issue, some others they haven't, but definitely it's going to be part of supply chain. I would agree with both of you. Yeah, and All right. actually, if I can comment to this, Yep. We, ha we have to see the controlled environment and the totally controlled and, and, and the environment agriculture is a supplement to the traditional uh, agriculture at the moment. We shouldn't say that, yes, with the closed environment, we will solve every problem. Uh, it is probably untrue. And we have to see this opportunity and a new way and an innovative aspect, uh, how we can extend or support our already existing uh, uh, traditional agriculture uh, uh, exercises. Uh, and and uh, definitely there is a room to, to improve that one. We can support it with our closed environment and we can improve and we can reduce ultimately cost for farmers. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah definitely. All right, uh, second question. So can a TCA strawberry project be viable and profitable? What are the main challenges for a profitable TCA strawberry business? Is the only way for a viable crop to sell it to a niche market and customers? And this time we can start with Java, where you can probably talk what we are doing in uh, IGS with your plant production systems there. Yeah, as, uh, as I tried to, tried to mention before, uh, in our system, we do use strawberries, we trial them heavily, our customers are interested in. And uh, 
not only national but international customers as well. And to be honest, everybody has their own priorities. Um, but at the moment, what we can say is our uh, vertical farming system is, is really suitable. And we demonstrated it this now through whole different trials that it is suitable for making uh, and producing plants from seeds. So what we can offer and what we can uh, really support is the growth of the plants, starting from the really first point. And uh, if we establish these plants, we can produce uh, uh, runners. And uh, of course we have, uh, and we still are optimizing our environment with the lights, with the temperature, with the humidity. And we were trying to, to provide the best condition for making runners. And these runners could be uh, propagated. They can establish again roots in a really short period. And these new plants could be used as a propagule for, for farmers to establish their plantation and uh, ultimately their body production. And we can see clearly that uh, in our facility, the time what it takes to make these plants is really short much, much shorter compared to, to the other traditional ways where you, where you probably start from seeds or, or from cuttings, you put into glasses or into an, another environment for it and so on. But, uh, but it takes time. It definitely takes time. Uh, the weather can heavily compromise the growth. In our system, we are trying to provide everything uh, really uh, in the way how that they should grow probably better uh, and quicker, definitely quicker. And this is a very big advantage again. And uh, it can, because we are independent from the weather and from the seasons as well, we can supply the plants continuously throughout the year. So, so this is how I can see uh, our advantage at, at the moment. Of course, we are trialing for flowers and, and for berries, but, but this is not at the point where what we can say it is really, uh, marketable and, and we can produce uh, these berries uh, at a very low cost, but uh, in the future it might be, we have to make new uh, developments, but uh, at the moment plant production is the main focus for us. Yeah, so uh, Java, the plant production for this type of business, like when uh, strawberry is focused not for the berries but for the plant production, Oh, so based on your opinion, it's going to be a viable project because you can supply outdoor growers actually. So you think definitely it's going to be a viable case study? I think so, yes. Yeah, yes. good. And, and, uh, and uh, there, there are many, many advantages. Okay, mm -hmm. of course, we can talk about the energy consumption and so on. Yeah. Our highly automation uh, enables to use relatively uh, low amount of labor work. And... Uh, Again, it is uh, independent from the weather, independent from the land. We can put anywhere. Uh, we use very few amount of water because we are recycling everything. Uh, but clearly, one of the main advantage, and I think the potato, uh, sorry, the strawberry industry suffers in the UK that if you import proper gears, especially from abroad, um, a really a, a kind of large amount of plants are already infected, and probably Peter can uh, can uh, confirm this. But uh, I, I heard uh, about percentages, how much is the loss actually when you import them from abroad. And in our system, we have a, a high health environment, it's not sterile, our system is not sterile, but very high health, which means that we don't have really pathogens. And uh, we can supply really healthy plants with no loss and uh, actually with high quality. That's good. Thank you, Java. Uh, so, Peter, what do you think? You, of course, focusing on the bed production. Do you think it's going to be a viable and profitable project? I know I, your answer, but let us know. <laughs> I, I have to agree with Chaba. Um, yes, it, it, it could be uh, viable and, of course, it, it could be profitable. We see these facilities uh, sticking their heads out everywhere around the world. Um, we at CropTech um, work very closely with our partners, our research uh, um, universities, uh, research centers um, from all over the world. And we all agree, yes, the cost is um, quite great at running these things, the electrical cost, the labor cost. But um, if you attach it to a farm setting, 
where the farm produces additional uh, um, crops, then of course it could be viable. Um, everything could be viable. Um, is, is there a niche market for the strawberry? Of course. Um, we see some strawberries selling for $5 per strawberry. Um, so there, there's always a market for strawberries. And here in the UK, we, we get our strawberries at a certain uh, time of the year. Um, if you go outside that time, then the strawberries become quite expensive. So uh, if a facility like this uh, provides strawberries right through the year, of course it could be viable. Yeah, and Thank if, you. And if I can connect to this point, and yeah. it depends on the market as well, because some markets are more valuable around the world compared mm -hmm. to others. You know, if you have a climate where you can produce the plants on the field, or in polyphenol, it's great. But if you have a climate where it is impossible, you have to uh, import the, the crops from, from, from abroad from thousands of miles sometimes. So, so in that market, you know, the vertical farming is even more suitable. But again, it depends on the needs of our customers. Good. Thank you, Java and Peter. So the next question is actually about uh, this uh, plants that they go into this TCI system. In conventional strawberry production, plants are planted in the tabletop probably systems as uh, small tray plants or bare root plants. But these plants very often can transfer pests and diseases in this TCI system that we try to be so clean. So in this way, um, what is the other options and other potential ways that we can actually source plants for TCI environments so to minimize those pests and diseases? Are there any other ways? So we will start with Peter and let us know what you think, Peter. So we, we've actually looked at uh, a few of these options. Uh, we looked at seeds um, where it's uh, quite labor intensive and not all the seeds uh, propagate. Um, and, then we, and then we still get um, contaminants via the medium that goes into it. So uh, we moved away from that and started looking at tissue culture. Um, which is a slightly more expensive way of doing it, but you're guaranteed 100% um, a clean plant, a clean substrate. Um, and when you work in TCEA, um, what we found at CropTech is that when you use tissue culture, there's absolutely nothing, no contaminants um, from any, any side. Um, if we bring in a medium that is 100% clean, um, we have zero problems. Um, yes, it's a slightly more expensive, more labor intensive, but we're always guaranteed um, a, a crop, 100% um, success rate. And um, we've been working with our uh, partners uh, over the long term and more and more are adapting the tissue culture side of things. Yes, some berry growers buys a couple of hundred thousand plants, but if you set up a lab and you do this in cycles, which most of the companies are doing because it's more cost effective, um, then of course, um, tissue culture is the way to go. Good, thank you. So Jamba, what do you think? Tissue culture or anything else, maybe seeds? I think tissue culture is a good option. Um, yes, it is clean, uh, genetically identical plants could be made and uh, if you have the facility and, and, uh, and uh, the proper labor workforce at the background, it, it is very good and it, it must, must be one of the best, probably. But I have to say that uh, we, we don't use this. So what we simply do is we get seeds and we start from seed and uh, we make the plants after that. So I partially agree that it is labor intensive. If we are talking about a couple of hundreds of thousands of plants, yes, definitely you need, you need labor at the background. Um, we don't do that uh, again, because we are not producing plants for, for market. And this is the role of our customers. But, uh, but if you can get seeds, it's not very difficult to, to just sprinkle on the top of the compost uh, of the substrate you put into the tower, you put for germination, it takes a long time, of course. After that, it takes uh, uh, time for growing. But during this period, you don't need labor because uh, the high, out, high, uh, high level of automation solves this problem. You, you don't have to do anything. 
You can check it remotely, you know, how they grow, anything happens, but you can take it down, you can have a look if you wish, but you don't have to do actually anything. For transplantation, you need, of course, labor work. That, that's true. Um, so, yeah, you have to compare probably the two system and uh, see how it works. But with seeds, you don't make too much contamination. I, again, it, it's a relatively clean system, and uh, and we we found that that it is it is okay. It is not a problem for the vertical uh, uh, growth uh, environment. And uh, what is very important to point out uh, with, current, <coughs> with current research that uh, seed seed is going to be much more important than it was before. So the hybrid breeding programs are very, very intense and very important nowadays. And not only in, in other crops like, uh, like potato. Potato uh, experienced uh, a, a very important uh, novelty and, uh, and development in the past five, seven years with, <clears throat> with hybrid seeds programs. So that crop is a really difficult one. But uh, people managed to, to prepare highly homozygous inbred lines, which could be propagated by seeds. And this is the same. Some companies and uh, probably academia is working on strawberries as well to produce hybrids uh, from seeds, and uh, which, which can be propagated by seed, from seeds. And imagine that uh, if it is true and it works well, Okay, I understand you need time to grow up the plants from seeds and uh, compared to the cuttings, this takes a uh, much shorter time. But if you establish these plants, these are okay. And uh, actually, you don't have to transport a couple of hundreds of thousands of plants uh, from one country to another country. You, you can send one kilogram of seeds. It's not too difficult. <laughs> and the carbon footprint, footprint is nothing comparable to those. And, uh, and you can start from this. So again, yes, yes, we can compare the two different things, but uh, I think uh, the seed is, is, might have a very important future. Uh, yeah, yeah, very important future. And depending on, this can accelerate actually the breeding as well. And this is very important because uh, if we can accelerate with a highly controlled environment, the breeding aspect of, of the actual work, this will produce much better varieties for the future. And I think we can positively contribute to this. Good, that's good, thank you. Uh, yeah, personally, when I have uh, done trials with uh, plants sourced from uh, nurseries, regardless, you know, which nursery they come from, you know, from time to time, you're going to have an issue and definitely a solution of tissue culture, which, you know, it's brilliant expertise to have in-house or maybe even seeds, you know, it's a very good option to have. And thank you both for your responses. So we received also a question related to yield. And my next question is, uh, apparently many people are asking about the fruit quality and yields in TCA. Are TCA crop any different compared to conventional systems? Com of course, about uh, fruit quality and yields. And uh, let's uh, start with Peter this time. If you can share a few things, not all the IP of CropTech, but you can share a few things, I'm sure. Um, yes. So what, what we found is we can grow the strawberries um, from planting to um, full fruit in half the time that it usually takes outdoors. And we can control the breaks um, with the amount of CO2 that we add to the system. And what we found is that um, the plants grow identical, the same amount of strawberries, sometimes slightly more in the TCA. But the most important part is the bricks. And um, we can push that up to um, between 11 and 13 um, constantly without any problems. Um, whereas you're growing in a polytunnel or a glass house um, where, they, uh, where you don't control everything as closely as the TCA, um, we find that um, the bricks is sometimes an issue. Um, it looks like a strawberry, but it doesn't always taste like a strawberry. Uh, but in the TCA, we have a constant feed of all the, the equipment, all the sensors, and we adjust uh, accordingly. So if we find a cultivar that is slightly less sweet, we can force it to be more sweeter by the growing environment. Um, CropTech has been working with uh, multiple partners um, in Europe 
trying to force the, the, the plant. So we've, what we've done is we've taken um, the least um, sweet strawberry that you can get with the lowest bricks and um, forced it to be as normal as we can. And what we found is that we can control that Brex um, with the environment, with the amount of CO2, um, with oxygen that we control. And with that part, um, we have no issues uh, whatsoever. And it's consi consistently a better strawberry than that they grow in the polytunnel. That sounds exciting. Thank you, Peter. Uh, Zamba, I know you're not the main interest of IGS is not really uh, berry production, but you can probably comment on the difference between producing the plants comparing to your towels and, uh, and other outdoor production system. Yes, yes, Katya, you, you are right. Uh, again, we have some values, of course, but, but we are not focusing on this. I, I absolutely agree with Peter that uh, we have one of the best uh, uh, facility in our hand now with total controlled environment to provide the best for the plants to grow or we can even influence them. And this is the main advantage. So we don't do any, any really tricks. It is not genetic modification. It is just, these are just normal plants, but we are providing what they can use in the in best efficient way in order to produce what we would like to have, okay? So it, it, I, I would like to make this clear. And, uh, and for example, uh, if I, uh, after germination, we use different recipe to grow farther the small plants. And when we plant them out into a larger space, again, we provide a different recipe, trying to make them, uh, to grow them much more runners. But yes, I, I experienced with other settings that if I change the environment, especially the light the temperature, yes, we can induce the plants for flower production. So really, uh, we can heavily influence what they do according to the environmental settings. And this is, again, a very important point for uh, the closed environment and vertical farming system. In a glass house, you will be never able to do that. Yes, you can influence them in a, in a certain manner, but, but there the conditions are not as precisely controlled what is, what is important to, to control in order to have the right product at the end of the day. So I really think that uh, we have uh, uh, an everyday um, improving system in our hands, which is suitable to, to produce what we would like to produce. Good, that's good. Thank you very much. So my next question, it's again a hot topic, pollination. What is the best way to pollinate strawberries in TCA? We have heard about all sorts of different stories, you know, like, uh, you know, brass pollination, uh, fans, bees. I have used bees as well, but what is happening with them finally? Can we use bees in the control environment agriculture? Let's start with uh, Chaba. Chaba, what do you think? <laughs> We don't have bees. <laughs> we don't have bees. I well, I would welcome them, but uh, at the moment we don't have. I think uh, in in our towers it is not impossible, and probably we would be able to accommodate to today our presence. Uh, but but at the moment we are not thinking about them, and, and we are not trialing them. Actually, to be honest, we we don't do this in a large scale. So what we do is I have I'm taking a large that, uh, dust brush and I'm just uh, trying to pull in the plants with this way. I think he probably Peter does not like this, <laughs> this system. Uh, I agree, it is not the best, but again, we are not focusing on this, but actually it works. So this is surprising, but, but it works. So, you know, on the small scale, but I want to see if it is enough for us, uh, uh, but uh, probably we, for the, for the, for a much better facility, a larger facility where you where you want really to focus on body production, uh, you need a much better system. I personally think it is not impossible to engineer uh, different solutions for this, and uh, uh, we would be able to do that. Uh, it takes time and uh, some thinking, but uh, 
Uh, again, uh, our hardware and software team would be able to do that. I'm really sure, and uh, it, it is it is viable probably. Uh, but but we have to think about it. We never try all this. And I yeah, yeah I'm really interested in uh, hearing what what Peter thinks how they do. Good, thanks. So yeah, we can do with brass. I have done, but I have seen a lot of miss uh, sapen ones because I believe myself at least I'm pushing the fruit. Then sorry, the flower. So <laughs> probably yeah. there's something wrong. But yeah, uh, yeah I, let's see. And actually, it's very difficult because if the the flowers are too small and the some larger leaves are covering them, you you cannot do that, and it's a big bit uh, bit problematic. So you are losing actually the the yeah. fruit and the and the yield. So probably, still the nature is probably better than, than the humans at the moment. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's hear what Peter has to say. I think you have some experience with the bubble bees. Let's listen what you have to say. Thank you, Katie. Um, Chaba, yes, you're 100% correct. <laughs> I, I do not like manually brushing each individual flower, although I've seen loads of flowers being brushed with a fan, and all of that, but the, the best pollinators out there is bees. Unfortunately, we can't um, work without them. When you have rows and rows of uh, um, strawberries in a vertical farm, the bees jump between them like it's a race. They see how quickly and how fast they can move between them. And it's absolutely amazing to watch. And um, we've done extensive research with bumblebees um, with our partners. CropTech has um, come up with a solution um, to make the bees used to the indoor facility, the, the, the air movement inside it, um, and everything about the bees. Um, it's another part of life. We have to look after it. Just like we look after our strawberries to make the best strawberries, we have to look after our bees. And it's, it's extremely important that we use bees for this. Um, when we do, when we use the the, the brush or the fan to uh, pollinate, um, hand pollination or manual pollination, what you want to call it, um, we always see between five and thirty percent of deformed strawberries. And if you do this on a commercial scale, that's not viable. That's a that's a great big loss. And if if you're putting in the money into one of these facilities, you want a hundred percent success rate all the time. And the only way to get that is with bees. Um, even when you have machines or robots doing this, there's uh, a lack of the ability of covering the whole of uh, the, the, the strawberry flower uh, with fans, um, with the brush, no matter how good you are, or how good you think you are, we always see that there's deformities in the strawberries. And on a commercial scale, I don't think that's viable. So bees is the most important part of um, indoor strawberry growth. Good, thank you, Peter. And uh, you know, my personal opinion is, yeah, of course I agree with this, even if you have to be in stand sometimes, you know, that's fine. Uh, but also me personally talking with some uh, experts, pollination experts, they are really keen to get involved into the vertical farming thing and TCA. So I think the best thing we have to do is to make a statement and say, guys, we're here and we want your help because the bumblebees, they have been solved, you know, this issue for glass health production, you know, how to take care of them and welfare and all these things. So, yeah, I think we just need to include them and talk with the pollinator experts. Good. Thank you. So, so can I, can we, I have a comment yeah. at this point, Katia? Sorry. Of course. Um, I, I could see a question among the questions from the audience that uh, they are asking about the uh, connection uh, between the LEDs and the bubbles. So probably, Peter, you cannot tell too many details, but uh, <laughs> probably, I, I agree with the question. So probably the LEDs are highly artificial compared to uh, natural light. So this can have an effect on, on the bees. Uh, can you comment anything on this? Yes, so um, a bee is a bee. A bumblebee is a bumblebee. Um, we have breeders from all over the world, but unfortunately we can't import and export certain bees from certain countries um, because they are inherent to that country. If they get out, they uh, um, infect our general population of our um, own UK bumblebees. So we use uh, um, the natural occurring bumblebees that um, is available in the UK. Um, when we look at the bumblebees, 
it's not so much the bumblebee that's the, the, the problem, it's more the lighting and the conditions. But if you um, control where the location of the, the, the beehive is and um, certain perimeters around the bees, um, they get used to it within five minutes. So um, it's not specifically a certain type of bee that um, is more um, susceptible to light conditions because they all are. They all see the, the UV spectrum. And if there's a slight uh, um, difference in the wavelengths, um, they see flashes of light, almost mm -hmm. like a strobe light in front of you. Yeah. Um, so from our research with um, our partners in the UK and in Europe, we've uh, established how to set these bees up, um, the location of them uh, in, into proximity to our LED lights um, and to the movement of air around the, the, the beehive. So it's, it's not only the, the um, type of bees or anything like that. It's just a general bumblebee that anybody can buy. And there's a, a few uh, suppliers in the UK that supply these bumblebees. Yes, they, they put an added price when you say, oh, I'm looking for a bumblebee for an indoor facility or something like that. But if you pick the right location with the right conditions inside your grow area, then they have absolutely no problems. And we've, we've worked um, extensively with our partners to establish those perimeters. So um, we take it further than just saying, just put a bee box inside. Um, because a lot of people, this is where they go wrong. They put the bee box inside. Um, in the UK, they even put these bees in polytunnels and let them populate the, 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 the general uh, um, uh, flowers in the area, not just strawberries. And everybody sees a benefit to that. So um, uh, the bumblebee in question that is used is the standard bumblebee um, supplied in the UK. Um, it's the conditions and uh, the location of the hive that is more important than anything else. Good, thank you, Peter. So one of the main issues with strawberry cultivation in TCA systems is the requirement of close control of environmental conditions. Strawberries, unlike other crops that are commonly grown in vertical farming, require fluctuation of environmental conditions between day and night. Strawberries also evapotranspirate much more compared to other vertical farming crops like, you know, every other leafy greens. What are your views on environmental condition requirements for strawberries in TCA? And we do have some more specific questions in the chat, but we can refer further down the line. Now, Peter, if you can start and um, tell us a few things about those environmental conditions in TCA, that would be great. Thank you. I'm, I'm not going to give any specifics. Thank you, Katie. I'm not going to give any specifics regarding uh, um, our conditions and how we uh, create those conditions. But um, what I can say is um, if you have a controlled environment, you seal everything off, you add the CO2. Um, there's a time in the plant's life where it doesn't just need CO2, it needs oxygen as well. All those things you need to take into consideration. If you're adding CO2, you can give it more light. You can give it more nutrients. You can basically force feed the plant to do what you want it to do at certain times in its life. <clears throat> so no matter um, the, the uh, plant type that you have, we can always uh, get the same results because we control every single environment from the CO2 to the oxygen, to the light recipes, to the nutrient recipes that we use. Everything is tailored exactly for that specific cultivar. And we have a list of cultivars that we've been working with now for some time. And the more, the longer we work with them, the, the closer we dial in these temperatures, these humidities and the CO2, the better the plants um, respond. And every time the plant responds even better, we get better results. So on average, we get between five and 10% more strawberries in half the time than the polytunnels or glass houses get. So the more we work on this, the better we get at it. And it's, it's, uh, extremely cost, uh, uh, costly exercise to do because uh, our first trials wasn't that successful. Um, we, we, we understood that we had a temperature swing from day and night. We understood that um, a certain amount of CO2 produces certain aspects inside the plant. Uh, but over the last two years, we've dialed that in um, to a point where we are stopped 
um, stop, uh, we stop completely working on the environment and we've passed that and we've gone to the hydroponic system now. So it's a whole system that works in unison and you can't always control uh, um, the amount of nutrients the plant take up, but you can force feed it to take up more than what it should. And in that way, we can determine the breaks before the plant arrives, before the strawberry arrives, um, which is the, the, the goal of TCEA, is to have that control, that ability to predict exactly what, when, and where happens to the plant. That's good. Thanks, Peter. And uh, Jab, over to you, of course, again, with the plant production side of things. Yeah, well. To be honest, I, I, I agree absolutely with Peter. Uh, high level of uh, controllability on the environment factors, it is essential. We do the same. Uh, it just depends on how we solve this problem. We, we have a couple of patents uh, in our system, how it works. It is a highly controlled, very precisely controlled <coughs> environment. And actually, we need it. And, and we do the same uh, how, how Peter uh, does did basically just changing slightly the different components of the environment. And uh, we are seeing improvements from trial to trial, how plants behave. And uh, I especially can change the, the lights. And uh, there's a question about uh, dimable LEDs. Yes, yes, we, we of course use uh, dimable LEDs. We don't use white uh, light source. We use just certain types of LEDs providing the right amount, the right quality of the lights at the right time to the plants in order to grow them. So we can, uh, we can change the composition of the light uh, uh, from the, you know, the red, the, the green, uh, the, the blue, and so on. So it is a highly precise change what we can, what we can do. And, uh, and yes, so we use an ebb and flood hydroponic system and uh, we control the watering very precisely. And again, just going to the point of labor work. So here you can spare a lot because it is, it is completely automated. You don't have to have anybody in the towers to do that. Everything is made automatically. Until the plants are in the growth stage, you, you just observe them. You don't have to do anything. You just have to check everything is right. The system uh, alerts you if something is not good. So, so a high level, high level of automation can help you to produce the plants in a kind of a cost effective way, in my opinion. And, uh, and yes, so this is what I am working on. I'm changing the different environmental conditions, temperature as well. Yes, uh, humidity could be changed. And, uh, and the day and night fluctuation could be important, I agree. Uh, although we don't do that uh, very often at the moment, but we are capable of doing this. Uh, and uh, probably this will be an important part for further uh, optimization. Yeah. That's good, thank you. Um, so now, during the last minutes, I would like to invite some of uh, the audience to actually ask their questions uh, themselves. So we have a question about labor and uh, Karen, if you want, you can unmute yourself and ask the question to the panel. Kerem is not probably listening, but I can ask the question for him. So, strawberry is labor intensive product. I think this is one of the main obstacles strawberry in vertical farming. Is there any solution multi tier system advised, or how many tiers are recommended? So, that's about labor. Mm -hmm. You can, whoever wants to answer that question. Well, uh, like uh, um, the, the question asks, um, is, is there a specific number of layers? Is there a specific number of length? Um, is the labor cost more? Yes. Um, if the higher you go, of course, the cost will be more. Um, in the general polytunnels with raised benches, um, for 100 meters, it takes a couple of minutes for a picker to go through there and pick the strawberries and move on to the next one. Um, in a indoor vertical farm where you have multiple layers, I think the cost would be more. Um, and the reason for that is simple. Um, you have a picker 
that has one row at uh, a meter high, his next row is slightly higher, slightly higher. And the higher you go, you either need a, an assistance um, to getting up to that height, or if you use a cherry picker, like some of our um, partners are using, uh, it costs uh, additional driver to drive that cherry picker. Even if you train your picker that picks the strawberries to um, drive the, the, the cherry picker down the, the aisle, he still needs to stop move along, stop, move along. So yes, labor cost is slightly more, but um, your fruit quality is better. Your quantities are better. So uh, it, it's all depending on your system. If you have a single warehouse where all your plants is grown exactly like they do in polytunnels or glass houses, then it shouldn't be much of a cost difference because you can still walk up and down the aisles at the same pace as you do in the glass houses and polytunnels. So there's not much difference between the two, um, but it's, it's system dependent. The higher you go, the more uh, um, cost you have of uh, picking the fruit. Okay, thank you. Of course, uh, you can, someone can use systems that they can rotate potentially or you know, not go too high, but definitely yeah. if you have a system just above your own height, you need to have a step ladder to go up. Yeah. And so, Actually, Actually, just connecting to this point, yes. So our system does does exactly what you are just explaining, Katya. Uh, I know and I, I understand that at the moment it is not really suitable for body production because of the area. It is relatively large. If Peter knows that, that it is not easy at all just to use it as, as, as in a simple way. But uh, still making adjustments and, and rearranging things, uh, it could be, we can make them uh, probably accessible for pickers and doing a cleaning process during the picking period and uh, put the magazine back to the tower. So uh, it is not impossible, we have to work on it, but I agree that uh, the, the actual very picking is, is a very labor is, is intensive part of the, of the process. But just going back to the previous point, for the previous parts to establish in the plants, it, it's not, it's really not in our system, especially. Uh, so actually you don't need too much uh, labor work uh, on those parts. Okay, good, thank you. So we have also a question about uh, the issue of energy consumption. How much energy, energy requires per kilo? I don't know if you can, someone answer this question. <laughs> That's we, yeah, just go ahead, Peter. We, we, we can't go into specifics um, yeah. because the, these are IPs yeah, yeah. related to exactly. our study partners and our clients. Um, a lot of them want to be the first. They want to be on top mm -hmm. of um, the industry, and we allow them to do that. When we work with our partners, our um, research facilities, uh, they ask to be uh, all of these numbers kept to themselves until we engage with another client. Um, Croptic has its own factory in China. So we produce these uh, for, um, equipment, um, containers, um, growing systems, um, and tailor them to our clients' needs. Um, so it's simple to say how much per kilo, but it's also system specific and your environment and the size of your uh, uh, grow. The, the bigger you go, uh, unfortunately, um, it doesn't become more expensive. Um, the bigger you go, it becomes slightly cheaper. So um, if we look at um, uh, a glass house that just went up, the bigger they went, uh, the, the lower the price came of a square meter of installing these things. Yes, so, thank you, Peter. Yeah, economies of scale definitely makes sense. So we have another question, a bit, it's long uh, answer a bit. So the question is, I don't know if Chris actually wants to answer the question, to ask the question. Chris Horn, would you like to ask me your question? Uh, sorry, which one, Katia? So you ask about the pros and costs of growing strawberries in LED versus natural light. Oh, uh, yes, yes, you've asked it perfectly for me. Thank you. Yeah, just interested in the comparison of vertical farming under LEDs <laughs> versus, you know, large scale glasshouse growing these days. Pros and cons. Well, um, first of all, um, all the pros is simple. You get your strawberries faster in half the time. Um, it's a sweeter strawberry, the quality is a lot higher. Um, 
there's almost no no difference between the the, the glass house grown strawberry and the indoor strawberry. It's just that you get it a whole lot quicker, and you can determine how sweet you want your strawberries. If you want it as sweet as you can um, by following a certain uh, a number of steps uh, through the plant's life, you can determine that. Um, yes, it's slightly more labor intensive, uh, depending on which route you're going to take, seeds, tissue culture, or that. But in general, a TCA strawberry is of a better quality and it's a lot sweeter strawberry. Um, and if you can find your market for your specific strawberry um, in your specific region and um, the time of the year, then of course you'll be able to sell it. Strawberries always sells. Um, I've never gone to the supermarket and seen loads of strawberries that's going out of date. You always get there and there's one or two uh, punnets left. Um, so strawberries always sells. And um, the upside of that is you can have a continuous production throughout the year. With normal glass houses and polytunnels, you can't have that. Good. Thank you, Peter. Um, oh, can, can I just connect to this point, maybe, with a couple of other thoughts, Katya? Yeah, we have uh, quite a few questions. That's why I was thinking to go forward. Okay. But go on, go on, go on. Ah, thank you. Well, great. I really wanted to mention something, but we haven't talked about it yet. So this is the chemical use. So people have to understand that we, we don't really use chemicals, especially in our system um, until the plant production. So you don't need that. So if you want to produce a high health quality, very nutritious food without chemicals, this is the way. Still in, in glass houses, you have problems right? and, and you have to do that. So this is a very big advantage. Of course, there is always a cost benefit uh, study at the background and, uh, and you have to calculate different things. Peter mentioned the acceleration of the, of the growth period. On the other hand, of course, we use much more energy, but uh, this balance will tell you at the end of the day, what is, how worse it is and what is the pros and cons for, for the rapid farming. Thank you. Good, thank you, Java. So, Gabriel, would you like to ask your question about genetic material? Hi, sure. Um, I think uh, I was very curious and interested to hear about what you're doing with regards to seeds. I have a vertical farm in the Congo in Africa, and I take most of my stuff from the UK or U European suppliers into Congo. Um, and it's been super challenging to take uh, plug plants or bare roots because mm. uh, they have to fly with me essentially every time I, I, I want to do that. And I use around 30,000 to 100,000 plants per year. Mm. Um, is, is there any way that you guys see um, growers becoming propagators themselves of the genetic material essentially to overcome issues yeah. like that? Um, from my point of view, uh, it's very easy. You just have to buy this type of facility that we have, and you can do it for yourself. So you can you can supply a relatively large market there uh, and anywhere actually. Um, I think it, it is okay if if you can find a good supplier for seeds, it should be fine. Uh, I I cannot see any major problem. Um, Peter probably has uh, another op uh, opinion about the propagation. Um, I, I have to agree with you. Um, if you're transporting um, seeds from all over the world um, to a specific place, um, setting up your own propagation is probably um, one of the better ways of doing it. A, a tissue culture lab and getting your, your scientists in and your, your lab technicians in to do a couple of hundred thousand plants. Um, as when, you're, when your plants are transported, um, you freeze them, put them in stasis and you can transport them wherever when you're ready or when they arrive in your, your destination, you can put them in cold storage and you keep them in that stasis for longer. Um, exactly what we do with the tissue culture. We, we propagate uh, a couple of hundred thousand plants at a time. Mm -hmm. um, when they get to a certain size, we put them in um, cold storage, freeze them, put them in stasis. And then when it's needed at specific times of the year, they can come out and um, go into the grow system. So your question is, um, are growers going to become propagators? In the near future, I think this is the way to go, um, especially if you grow in TCA, where your environment needs to be 100% clean to use no herbicides, pesticides, yeah. or anything like that, or any chemicals um, to fight molds or mildew or anything like that. It, it is super important that everybody involved has some sort of idea 
as to how to get this under control. And as Chaba said, they use seeds, um, which is an extremely uh, valuable way of doing it. Um, not 100% the best, but tissue culture, on the other hand, you are guaranteed your product every single time with zero defects. Um, and it's also an identical copy of the plants that you have. So um, genetic anomalies do not occur with that. Um, you're guaranteed your, your, your strain, your, your breed, your plant every single time. Good, thank you, Peter. Uh, we have also a question from Claire about F1 seeds. Claire, would you like to ask your question? Hi, everyone. Um, it was just um, interesting to hear what you said about F1 seeds. Uh, it wasn't really a question as such, um, but just interesting to hear your comments on how the industry is going to go moving forward. At Elsom's, we are seed specialists, and we've just launched three new varieties into the UK at the moment of F1 hybrids. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting to see your thoughts and feelings on how the market's going to change in the near future. Thank you, Claire. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this one, if I, if I may. Yep. Um, thank you, Claire. Um, I think um, strawberry breeders are one of the most important parts of this whole uh, community that we are in. Um, strawberry breeders are the, at the, the precipice of what we do. Um, they can specifically design plants for specific uh, uh, conditions. So when we are able to control those conditions and working with breeders from all over the UK, Europe and the United States, um, we've seen that certain breeders has an advantage because they do so much breeding. Um, some companies that we work for here, in, that we work with here in the UK have established breeds, but they are continuously breeding and continuously releasing new breeds. Um, we test these breeds on a large scale for them, and we can see exactly in a short, short period of time what these do. So normally breeders go out into a, a glass house plant their plants, wait a full cycle, and it takes a long time for strawberry to go from uh, seed to full flower to the end of its life. Um, what we do is we cut that time in half. So when we work with breeders to do this, we turn that cycle around very, very quickly for them. So instead of just having one or two trials at 200 different sites, you can have 200 cycles in one single container and you can control every single aspect of that. So it's very important that breeders are at the forefront of what we do. Um, they provide the plants, the species, the strains that give us the delicious strawberries that produces the, the quantity and quality that we require to make this uh, um, all profitable. So um, you guys are extremely important to what we do. Good, Peter. I, I agree, just a quick comment. Uh, I, I absolutely agree with, with Peter and uh, it is really important. And to be honest, uh, the vertical farming is opening up new directions for the hybrid seeds and the new varieties because our requirement might be different. So to, to use a vertical environment in a much more efficient way, how we try to use, we need a certain size of the strawberries, you know, uh, certain requirements. And if the breeders can influence the plants in this way, we can provide a much uh, more cost effectively this environment. And in this case, still reducing the cost of the very production or profitable production. So it, it's really important. Good, thank you. We are running out of time, but I think there are a few questions that are worth asking. So I'll just uh, probably go over and a bit. Um, Imogen, I don't know if you would like to ask your question about the sensor system. Hi there. Um, yeah, it's uh, loving it. So interesting. I was just wondering, um, yeah, what type of uh, sensory data you collect and do you use a specific program, um, you know, to optimize your growing sort of what, yeah, what program do you use? Is it linked up? What type of measurements are you collecting? Can I take this one maybe first? Okay, thank yeah, you. On. So, um, so basically, uh, we develop our own system. Again, it is fully automated and it is a cloud-based uh, software that is running in the towers and it controls <laughs> everything from the humidity, temperature and, and the light recipes. 
um, uh, on the different uh, growth trays. And uh, we collect uh, this data uh, globally for our vertical uh, towers, uh, actually. And uh, we, we have automated uh, photos uh, as well in the system. We can program the software how often we want to see the, the plants on the tray. We collect this data and we use uh, AI to understand uh, the behavior of the crops under different recipes. And in this case, we can make a fine tuning of the environment, further improving uh, the quality of the crop, the yield, and reducing the, the cost uh, period. And uh, we, are, we are developing our own software team are, uh, is developing this system continuously. And we are uh, finding uh, the solutions for our problems, but uh, all the environmental parameters are monitored and recorded, uh, and it is used to further improve the system. Thank and you. Um, so we have another question from uh, Sebnem. I don't know if Sebnem is here and wants to ask his question. I'm happy to ask you. Or... Well, Hello, yeah. everyone. Hi. And we are building a plant factory in Turkey with artificial lighting. And uh, I just wonder, uh, what is recommended uh, carbon dioxide level in indoor farming? Are you recommended any level about carbon dioxide? Yeah, probably we cannot cover this type of uh, question in terms of IP. But... You have also asked questions about uh, LEDs and spectra. So if you would like to ask this, would be great. Yes. Yeah, so and basically, we had we have answered the dimable LEDs already. So we covered the, the, this topic. So yes, we, we can highly precisely change the LED uh, LED lights, and uh, this has a very strong influence, according to my experience, on the growth of the plant. Yes, so um, I'll, I'll just take off from there. So the amount of light that is provided to a strawberry um, directly determines um, the, the root size. The root size of your plant directly determines the amount and size of your strawberries. So um, the exact amount of light to provide over a strawberry, we can't go into detail. Uh, but we as an LED company um, provide a specific spectrum um, for the strawberries and we intensify that over the life of the strawberry plant as it grows. So we have dimmability control throughout um, the system. We also create a day and a night effect. So the lights power up um, slowly um, to a certain point, and then at night it dims down, just like you would have a sunlight. Um, that's also very important for um, the uh, bees. So the bees can go home at a specific time. If you just turn the lights on and off, the bee stays around the, the, the plant, it can't go home, it flies around uh, um, incoherently and simply dies off. So yes, light is very important, but you need to get the right amount. And if you're applying CO2 to your system, you can usually add more light, but this is all um, relative. If you, the more CO2 you add, the more light you add, and if you don't add your nutrients in the same quantities, then you have deficiencies or nutrients burn on your plant. So it's a very, very close uh, um, loop that you have to follow um, in accordance with TCA um, when you do this. It's very specific. And slight, slight changes while you're learning this is very important. Um, if you just bump things up, it takes you a long time, but it gives you a lot of data over these times. Okay, thank you. And I think the last question for today is from NDS. If you would like to ask your question, and you are here. I can ask it. So what plans exist for use of renewable energy solar, including battery storage to offset the energy cost with growing systems? There's, there's multiple systems out there. There's battery packs, solar systems available uh, to compensate for the additional cost that you have for um, um, the electricity consumption for one of these facilities. Um, you have wind power. At, at the moment, we are on a path of renewable energy. 
So um, everything is available out there. Uh, it adds an additional cost to your facility, of course, but your, your return on investment should be a lot shorter if you use renewable energies. Yeah, I agree completely. And uh, basically our system is designed to do in this way because uh, again, <clears throat> you, can, you can put up the, the vertical towers anywhere where you have a high source of renew, renewable energy. And this is probably the future, try to utilize uh, these options uh, around, the, around the world anywhere. And if you can get electricity uh, from a renewable source, this makes your cost heavily done after uh, an initial uh, uh, establishment of the facility. And uh, yes, one of our customers said that they have plenty of solar energy, how to use, what to use, and then they might decide to go to our system. So yes, it is, it is viable. People are thinking about it, people are doing it, and, and uh, that car farming is absolutely suitable for this. And there is one, one more thing uh, that we are trialing at our farm in, in, uh, in, the, in, in Scotland. So basically, we use a high energy uh, during the, the day and the night as well. And uh, we, we consume a lot, which can have an impact on other customers uh, in the nearby village or, or city. You know. But uh, there's a system that I'm not really familiar to, but we, we call it flexing that. Uh, at some certain point of the day, if there is a high peak from other customers, we can provide back energy from our farm, actually complementing the needs of the grid. And that's why supporting the, the local community. And if it is peak hour is over, we can take a, a, again the same amount of power, but that is not really required for people at that time. So this very smart, uh, again, very smart uh, solution helps a lot uh, to compensate any energy balances in, in the grid system. Good, thank you. I think that was it. We have overrun a bit, but we had very nice, interesting questions. It was great actually to be with you, Peter and Java. Great opportunity to meet you. I'm really pleased and I hope everyone enjoyed that session. So thank you very much. If you want to get in touch with us, go to www.ukuat.org and you can find more information, but also the contact for Peter and uh, Jamba or contact me and then I will link you with them. And thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, thank you very much, Katya. It was nice to meet everybody and I really appreciate UK UAT's help uh, to get to people and it's very important to discuss and talk about things. So thank you. Thank you, Katie. Thank you, Chaba, for inviting us to this very special, um, very proud moment for CropTech. Um, if there's anything else um, that anybody is looking for, you can find us at um, www.croptech.com. Um, all our contact details are on there. Um, we're also part of uh, the UK UAT group. Um, you can find us on there. Um, any references that you require, please, um, Katie is there to assist you.